No one can argue that we are living through extraordinary times, but every day all around the world, through acts big and small, girls are changing the world. This International Day of the Girl, I am celebrating the power of girls. I am Girl Rising. Hello, Girl Rising. My name is Daniel Kine. I'm a CIEE Civic Leadership Summit alumni from Ireland, and I co-founded Opinion X, an online survey tool for identifying consensus among large groups of people. We started working on Opinion X in September 2019. We were really interested in the area of public consultation, how governments engage citizens to inform policy and strategy decisions. When we went and talked to people in the public sector from a local and national level across various countries, we realized that a lot of them are using pretty standard survey tools for engaging with their citizens. The problem, as we saw it, was that survey tools are really only made for measuring, quantifying and validating things that you already know. For public consultation, you want to learn about new things. When you're engaging hundreds or thousands of people, you can't just open up a box for unlimited opinions because then the job of analyzing and understanding those responses can become really overwhelming. How could we create a survey tool that prioritizes open-ended questions and learning about new perspectives while also keeping the analysis work both meaningful and manageable? This is what led us to Opinion X. Opinion X is an open survey tool. This means that unlike a normal survey, participants on Opinion X can vote on each other's opinions. Our platform then analyzes the voting patterns to understand the consensus, division, and importance of different topics within all of the participant statements. It enables the researcher to learn things that they wouldn't have even known to ask about in a normal survey, to discover hidden insights in the voting data of participants, and to engage participants in an easy to use platform that's more fun and unique than just another survey. Since returning from my summer in the US last year as part of the CIEE Summer Work and Travel Program, I met my co-founder Dara, we've raised 130,000 euro in funding, made our first two hires and have had over 50,000 votes cast on OpinionX. We've had great success with our pilots in the public sector and non-profit sector. Now we're focused on getting OpinionX online for anyone to use. We believe that our technology can go a long way in helping decision makers to better understand large groups of people and to make online engagement more fun and insightful. At OpinionX, we're motivated by the idea that anybody can make a difference. You don't need to have decades of experience, a global network of decision makers or a proven track record. All you need is an idea and the courage to make it a reality. We're already one year into the Opinion X journey, and in that time, we've heard a lot of people say no. We've had a lot of confused faces when we describe what we're trying to build, and we've hit a lot of dead ends. And that's a really normal part of the process. Among those barriers and roadblocks, we've had some amazing days where everything clicks and we make even more progress. The key to shaping the future is fighting through each no to get to another yes. Every one of us is capable of this determination and grit. Today is the day to start thinking about the challenge you want to tackle in the world and to start planning how you're going to do just that. My biggest piece of advice, bring others on this journey with you because nobody accomplishes anything alone. Find a community in your local neighborhood or even online and share your mission with them. The best part about making progress is having others to share the wins with. I'm Daniel Kine. I'm a CIEE change maker and I, I'm Girl Rising. Hello, I am honored to be here with all of you today as we come together to celebrate the girl champions, the storytellers, the change makers on the International Day of the Girl 2020. Now, no one can argue that we're all living through extraordinary times, but alongside the suffering and the devastation, there are stories of transcendence, beauty, hope, and the triumph of the human spirit. My story, Girl Rising Storytelling Challenge, serves as a beautiful reminder of this. I want to thank the more than 1,500 individuals from 90 countries around the world who shared your stories. Every single one of your voices matter and they need to be heard. We are inspired by your creativity, your fearlessness, and your vision for a better world. 
And now it is up to all of us to show the same kind of courage as we listen, intently and deeply. At this moment in time, it is vital for all of us to listen and learn from one another, to forge new connections with each other despite our differences, and to open our eyes to the needs of others and understand each one of us can contribute. These stories help us to do just that. Today, we honor our courageous storytellers and the unlimited power and potential of girls around the world. I am Frida Pinto, and I am Girl Rising. My name is Farida. My name is Farida. My name is Rajab. My name is Juliana. My name is Rosemary Akini from Nairobi, Kenya. And I'm Shipetane Uba Africa Chipewe. My name is Arumi Sanjay. My name is Kaiyan Kaiyan. My name is Abimbola. Noyona. Shesim. Saida. Ninja Mankwa. And I'm Kaliya Gazar. Wanero Galunga. Gladys Ivy Wanjira. My name is Shimbi Angela. My name is Rita Azepo. And I took the action against sexism and gender inequality. Or in dates, I have been four times. And I run the first ever cycling school for women in my village. Because we believe African American history is American history. To empower girls to understand who they are. To help us further our education and succeed in this country. Eradicate poverty. All men, we believe India is top black. Distributed food packs to families in slums during the lockdown. Because this world is in need of acts of black. Interfaith harmony. Gender equality. Stand up for our rights. And the millions of girls who cannot speak up for themselves. This is my story. This is my story. 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 This is our story. Eu 
médicos, também dentro dos empregos, no salário, em que nenhum, ninguém é superior a ninguém. É isso que a gente prega no, no trabalho. So tell me, how did you hear about the Girl Rising Storytelling Challenge? So I had the Girl Rising from a friend. I, I have a friend who once submitted a story sometime back. He's called Henry. So he told me about how you can share stories, how, you know, your stories can get to inspire people and, you know, it can help, you know, push a movement or start something, give someone an idea to push what you're doing forward in other communities. Ladies, I am so excited to meet you today. I have been listening to your podcast and being a podcast lover, I can just say how much I feel already connected to you, not only by the power of your voice, but the subject matter you guys engage in and your work focusing primarily on the power of stories and mental health. Can you Share with us the journey for how you actually decided to use storytelling and recognizing story was the power to be used for addressing such issues. Yeah, so I think what both Kavya and I understood is that the way to address mental health is to actually get, especially for the youth, is to actually get their voice out and showcase their voice. And we do that in two ways, uh, the, actually three ways. The first is through our podcast. Um, which, you know, we started a long time ago. Kavya was super, <clears throat> excuse me, Kavya was super adamant about it. Um, I think to us, just being able to be vocal about what we're going through, because, you know, there isn't exactly um, a student-led body to actually talk about what, uh, what the students are going through, what the youth is going through, especially through these like unprecedented times. And to us, the way to actually vent and the way to let other people vent, other students vent, was through creating these podcasts, as well as creating our articles. We also have, um, if you see our website, we have a column just for student written articles. And not only does it address things that the students are going through, but also about how to help kids, you know, if you're an adult, how would you help your child if you don't know what to do, things like that. So we use our articles as a form of storytelling. We use our podcasts as a form of storytelling. And lastly, we also use our social media as a form of storytelling, because I think that is just the most convenient way and the most powerful way to connect with the youth, at least, especially in the 21st century. So um, those are the three ways in which we do tell our stories and it's all completely student-led and comprises of all the youth voices. Yeah, you exactly. Know. Go ahead, Kavya. Um, so uh, I just want to add to that because uh, we, were, uh, we have a list of counselors we talk to, to not just vet our work, but to provide information to students if they require it. One of the things they said is the one thing the youth requires is for the experience to be validated in order to make, make them understand that mental health is important and what you're going through is okay and you will get through it. And I think this is something that Arushi had also really pushed for with the articles was showcasing other people's experience to validate experiences other students and other uh, ch children go through, uh, go through throughout. And the best way to do that is through stories. One of the most fascinating uh, stories about you guys is the image you guys took in front of the monument in Virginia. Why was it so important for you guys to go and actually perform at this most monumental 
moment to not only celebrate, but the choice of the location in the moment of time was also critical. Virginia is the former capital of the Confederacy, and the statue is of General Robert E. Lee. So I think it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, um, monuments in downtown Richmond. So before, it was just a statue of a man who didn't do great things, and the community has come together just to make it truly, like, beautiful. So we've turned something that was so um, kind of cruel into something that can be used as a teachable moment for everyone that's witnessing this right now, which is, I think, a lot of people now. Now, I understand you were raised with seven sisters as the only boy, and I imagine that must have impacted your outlook on life, but I'm very curious and interested on how exactly did that impact your outlook on life and your own stories and how you show up in the world? We are three boys and seven girls. So being the fact that I grew up in a, in a low income family, in a low kind of income family. So the little that they, my, my parents used to get, they used to give to the boys. And being the fact that it was like I was the only boy left in the house since the other ones were grown, everything was given to me. All the privileges were given to me. And I have this sister, Stella, the one I follow. So she went to a different school. We were just one class, you know, it was just one class different because I was a class below her. So whenever she went to school and came back and used to share whatever, you know, whatever she went through, it, it was really heart touching. Am I really a brother, if at all? I remember most, most instances asking my mom, you know, can I please go to the same school as Stella? Or can she please come to my school so that we can try, at least I could be there to protect her. But the answer was always no. So I grew up to say, you know what? We are equal. We are all humans. So we need the same rights. We need the same, we need the same opportunities. Wow. Yes, and that is how I started to go into issues of gender equality understanding the stories and experiences of your sisters in your own connection with them became sort of like an impetus. When uh, I speak about my sisters, it's like I'm speaking about my whole world. I do everything, even the work that I do now, you know, engaging with the boys. I think about my sisters because I'm, I believe if I'm engaging these boys, I'm engaging them to become better men, better men for girls like my sisters. I'm engaging them to become men who are responsible, men who look at women as equals. What has it been like for you and your friends as part of this? I mean, you guys are young to be leading such incredible change, but then again, you know, young people have always been at the forefront of social change. Yeah, it's been really amazing because, like, you can't really um, hate on a beautiful picture that we're not saying anything or doing anything bad. It's just showing our art and what we can do. It definitely makes you be a better person and just push yourself to advocate for everyone else as well. And just being a part of something bigger than yourself is amazing. And knowing that you can inspire people of all races, ages, um, just anything different. And just um, promoting that to the world is way better, makes you feel better when it's about other people as well. One of the biggest vision around the work that we do and at Girl Rising, we think about very bigly, is about creating a world that value girls in their education. If you could create a world where girls are of value, what would that world look like for you? In society, there are huge gender stereotypes, and that's also a major problem, and I would definitely like what Kennedy said, I would definitely just make sure that women support women and you, everyone's powerful and you don't have to conform to a stereotype. Yeah, I agree with them. Basically, like people, like women supporting women and not people tearing people down just because on like what they look like, how they act, what color they are, what clothes they wear, and just body positivity and skin positivity. Mm, I love the part skin positivity. You don't hear that a lot. I guess it's the world that I already have in my head. Mm. A, a world where women are, women and men are equal. A world where women are not looked at as uh, opportunists. A world where boys actually 
you know, also engage in the care roles and responsibilities. I'd also look at a world where, you know, education for all is free. You know, mm. education does not have to be just for the boys, just for for the girls, but education is free for all. And education is something that, you know, people get to enjoy fully. What is your vision for a world where girls are valued? What's in that world? What does it look like? We know it, mental health is accessible to every single one of them. What else would you have in this world? I think for one, it's going to be investing in women. I think what I've seen, especially growing up, is that there's this lack of empowerment that comes um, not only from adults, I would say, but also, you know, um, boys in my classroom, in my school. Um, there's this lack of belief in females. So I was saying, um, I'm talking about investing in women and how women empowerment is just becoming increasingly important throughout the years. And with Kara, I think both Kavya and I have also become more and more empowered seeing, I mean, pre predom predominantly our um, student-led organization of Kara is women, it's girls. And just to see the uh, intellect and to see the kind of ideas that we're having, it poses the question, why wasn't this done before? Why weren't females invested in before? Imagine the kind of um, change making that could have been done. Imagine the amount of progress we would have made in the world if females were just taken into consideration. I mean, there are countries that only allowed females to vote in the 90s, which is far too late considering voting started like more than a century ago. Um, so I think just in, in including women, investing in women, believing in women, um, those are three really important things that we have to start inculcating in um, not only our mindsets, but in everything we do. Um, it's important to, you know, include women in every single activity that we do, include um, the interests of women, especially, not only just including them, but their interests in everything you do as well. And so I guess my vision for um, the future world with females is just equality in its truest sense, equality in rights, equality in um, their voices, equality in their beliefs, simply just pure equality to me. Thank you all for all of the amazing work you've done as part of the Young Leader Task Force this summer with Girl Rising. And you all had the really hard job of reading or watching, listening to all of these 1500 stories that were submitted as part of my story. And I just wanted to ask you, what was it like for you? What was it like reading and watching these stories? And we'll just go we'll just go down down the order that i see you all on my screen here vicky do you want to go first at first when we when i saw like so many stories it was a big like overwhelming i said oh how am i going to do this um but it was really i don't it was a really good experience because we know that there are so many injustices in the world and all that but reading them from like in first person it hits you differently it was such a unique unique experience because you know that it is not fiction it's not someone's just imaginary like story but it is a living living truth it is someone else's someone's experience and it is just such a different feeling because when you just think about it they find it as a safe space they trust you and they feel safe and confident to share their truth and their experiences, their maybe very vulnerable stories with you. And I think it's like um, a once in a lifetime experience to listen to people's voices. We've all been in, like, in a position where you can't share something, but it was such an honor for me to like listen to people's voices. And it's mostly voices that are, that are silenced. So it was, it was a great opportunity and I'm glad that I had the chance to like read people's stories, listen to them. And sometimes I was just like, I want to give this person a hug so bad, but uh, it was great. Yeah. And Sophie, I think you're one of the many that read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. So tell me, what, what was it like for you? I think it was just, it was just so beautiful. It was like, I got to step into these people's minds. I got to step into the living rooms of all these different people all around the world and hear their stories and was so incredibly inspired by every single one of them. Um, they were just beautiful. It was cool to see the creative things that people are doing in some cases, um, the little things. It was also really empowering um, 
to see, because it wasn't all women who were submitting stories. There were also men submitting stories about women in their life. Um, there was one from, I remember so clearly, this little boy. Um, I cannot remember where he was from, but it was a story, I think, about his grandmother and just how he thought his grandmother was just this incredible strong woman. Um, and it was just, like so sweet and simple, maybe just a paragraph long, and just so moving. I just thought, this is so cool um, that this young boy has this perspective. Did the experience change the way you think about yourself and your place in the world? Or was there a story or a set of themes in the stories that really stood out to you and, and that you felt was interesting? For me, when I was reading the stories and how much uh, the stories changed me, I was reading these stories and I'm like, like I resonate with some of these stories, but some of them I'm just like, this is an amazing story that I think the world should hear about. This is somebody's voice, somebody telling you like their life experience that I think it changed me as a person the way I like I, I used to think some things and I'm just like I don't think that's that's how everybody else thinks about certain situations and you read about all these experiences that people have gone through and I actually learned to learn and sometimes I feel like I used to think like me personally I don't think I make that big of a change in the world by reading about these little girls these little boys who are just like doing something very small like the picture of the little girl protesting it wouldn't look like something that big, but then you see that little girl trying to make a change in the world, trying to make an impact in the world. And that just changed my perspective on like different levels. I was like, I'm realizing how much that little thing you do could make like a huge impact in the world. It is such a different experience to read one than to have this collection yeah. and have so many that you're processing and living with. So um, yeah, it's very interesting. And what about you, Vicky? It made me realize how privileged I am, especially when I, it made me feel bad with myself because sometimes I say, oh no, I have to work or I have to study and all that. And when you read these stories, I, especially in my case, I had like this theme of women being forced to get married at such a young age and not being able to do what they wanted to do. So I realized, well, these women want to study or to work and they are forced to get married and to take care of their family. So, well, I have the privilege of doing what I want because I can work, I can study and now no one can take that away from me. So it made me realize that, well, I have to be aware of the privileges and the things that I can do did it change my view of my place in the world? I would say absolutely. I think um, it simultaneously made me feel very much part of this huge, larger global community, just getting to read all these stories. Um, and even as, I mean, as a woman, but I do think that I'm a very privileged woman and just my place um, in the world and all the resources that I've had not been exposed to growing up. Um, but still as a woman to, see all these people sharing their stories and certain things I could connect with. Um, and it just made me feel like part of this huge body of women and people who want to support women. I want to start by having each one of you introduce yourself. So Karen, we start with you. Well, hello everybody. I'm Karen Khan. I'm the Chief Brand and Communications Officer at HP. I'm so honored to be here. Girl Rising is a remarkable partner and organization. And Christina and I go way back in that um, storytelling is central to who I've always been as a leader. I do believe that stories can change the world. And I think that wonderful storytellers and empowered storytellers can change the world truly for the better. And, and that's what we're looking at here. It's just the, the bravery and the, the intimacy that we're seeing. I, I just feel very inspired uh, to be part of this. So thank you. And that's me. Hi everyone, my name is Nabila Aguele. I am the, uh, I'm one of uh, several special advisors to the Honorable Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning in Nigeria. Uh, I'm also a lawyer and a creative. Um, and so storytelling is at the core of, of who I am as a professional and, and as an individual. Um, I really do believe in the power of stories to change hearts and minds, as you say, and also um, from the African perspective to 
really give uh, us people, women, girls, and, and, and folks from the African continent in particular, a voice and other continents, a voice with which to tell our own stories. And I think particularly in this time and age, it's so important that we have authentic narratives being shared from the perspectives of those who are living and experiencing them, which is why it's such an honor and a privilege for me to, to be part of this conversation and to get to uh, play such a small part as a judge for the, the competition. So it's such a pleasure to meet all of you. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Trisha Shetty. I am a social activist, um, a feminist based out of uh, India. And uh, we started an organization called She Says, which serves to engage uh, youth to be, uh, you know, agents of social change and demand for equality for all. And uh, um, I'm a lawyer by training. And uh, just thank you, I guess, during these dark times for bringing so much light uh, into our lives through the um, the truth and stories of the wonderful people you've shared, uh, you know, that have shared with you and you've shared with us. So thank you. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Well, thank you all. And as you know, we received over 1,500 stories from over 90 countries. They were extraordinary um, and courageous. And you all just a few weeks ago uh, received 30 of them to review and to decide which 15 would be the 15 showcase stories. And I want to just ask you, what was the experience like for you? Reading, listening to these stories, and is there a particular one that stood out? And we'll just go in the opposite order here. Trisha, why don't we start with you? You know, I often think of um, stories and where do they come from, right? They come from an intrinsic place of truth. Um, and when we say stories have the power to move mountains and change uh, 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 social structures, it's because it's people sharing their truth. And uh, in India, we have this uh, in Urdu, we have this word called hak, uh, and hak we loosely translate it as rights, but actually the true origin of that word is truth. And you know, how can you not have human rights but from a place of truth? Um, so in terms of uh, what was the experience like, whose story stood out for me, um, I feel like I'm doing a disservice almost sharing whose story stood out for me, but uh, I'll say just on the basis of my lived experience, um, the girl called Kareen, um, who's 18 when she wrote her story and is a CV girl. And um, David Miliband, um, you know, the head of ICRC, had made a statement where he said, um, refugee camps are places where dreams come to die. And that always stood out to me. And when I read uh, Kareen's words where she said, um, can the desire to become a beloved artist ever be extinguished? You know, my mind is free, but my body is not. And um, she ended it with saying that, if you choose to join my journey, this is a young girl who was deprived education and dreamed in Technicolor and dreamed of a life she could have, but is acutely aware that it was taken away from her because she was deprived this getaway to education. And she ended it with saying, if you choose to join my journey, you have to fight and you have to dedicate yourself completely with your soul, heart and body and I think that's so important, the profound wisdom of an 18 year old who recognizes this fight um, takes all of you. You have to dedicate yourself. There's no off button. You know, you don't go, oh, now I'm done fighting for human rights. Now I'm going to switch this button off, you know, as a nine to five job. Nabila, what about you? What was the experience like for you? Um, so the experience was, it was mixed emotions. Um, I was profoundly moved by all the stories. Um, really hopeful, really optimistic, really excited um, and, and inspired, you know. I think we're here having this conversation from a platform um, uh, uh, that we've been privileged to have. And in these stories, I see so many people who um, either with the little, either individually or through organizations in their community are finding ways to, to be uh, everyday leaders. And something that, that I always emphasize that um, is that, you know, leadership is something that you practice on a daily basis. You don't one day wake up and all of a sudden are given a platform. Um, you choose it, you live it, uh, you breathe it. It is, it is 
part of your it's at your core and in these stories i see so many um people who many of whom are very young who have chosen to uh bear their souls on paper or through video to tell their truth sometimes very personal very painful truths um and to convert those truths into action into activism into grass grassroots change um uh, some of whom have risen out of a reaction to the covid uh, uh 19 pandemic which to me is also a lesson in that sometimes uh, you know these moments where we're feeling disappointed and and, and feeling despair, um, that agitation for change, that, that feeling of dissatisfaction, um, we can often convert those emotions into uh, um, change and into activism. So, so I was really profoundly moved and inspired. Karen, what about you? What was it like for you to read, to read these? Oh, stories? You know, it, it's funny, I've read them over and over again. I think for me, because I do so much work in the storytelling world of helping people to find their narrative and explain, you know, ethos and logos and how you tell a store, great stories have love and hate and trust and mistrust. And, and they have so many elements that, that draw us in to make the stories meaningful and memorable. And uh, there is something that is so brave and powerful about every single one of these stories. And um, one of the things that, um, that, that I, I'm so struck by, because I, I remember this journey as we were, first we had 30 entries, and then there were 80, and then there were 100, and then all of a sudden there were, there were hundreds, there were too many to keep up with. And, and I felt at one moment we're in you know, Nigeria, no, now we're in Zimbabwe, no, now we're in Guatemala, and you can just be transported into the lives and, and the worlds through, through these stories. There is not a chance in the world that I, I, I I can't tell you one that, that I could pick. What are the stories in your work you've seen that make the most difference in terms of changing the narrative for policy, for resource allocation? And, you know, you can, we can start with you, Karen, from your, in your current capacity. And I think the, the, the greatest power, particularly in this kind of program, is just giving voice to the voiceless. What would have happened had we not had this beautiful competition. We, we wouldn't know any of these people. We wouldn't know these organ. Oh, of course, Christina always would because you, you guys are so close to this. But for me, such a big part of it is, you know, storytelling is humanity and it's connecting our heads with our hearts. And um, unlike many of you, I, I work in the corporate world. And so much of my world is about, it's about data and analytics, but, but data isn't memorable and people are. And so, Elevating stories of real people, of, of real issues, of real problems, and giving them names and faces and geographies. And um, Trisha, I loved what you were talking about, putting your body behind this. I mean, so many of these stories, these are intimate stories. These are intimate stories of, of people's lives and their challenges and, you know, their, their, their hopes and dreams. And so for me, it's it's just really finding ways to give voice to, to these voiceless areas and fund them in a way so that we can help to end systemic racism, systemic lack of education, systemic inequality, and so on. It's, it's putting action behind words, but words have to come from real life stories. So for me, what's great now from a storyteller, from someone who loves to tell stories, is that when there's that perfect alignment between data and the stories that we need to and, and should tell, it makes my work a lot easier. Um, and I, and I, I would, the only other thing I would say is, you know, and this is speaking from the perspective of someone who is African, but also North American and, and from different places, is having grown up in so many different places, having grown up in the Middle East, in England, in, in Canada, Canada had been in the US and now in Nigeria, what I found is, is that um, despite our differences, a lot of the stories are very similar. 
Um, and so I, I, I think what's really important is to bring together enough of a diversity of stories at, at a broader platform such that we, we start to really understand that, yes, we have a lot in, of differences, um, but there's a lot of shared values and shared experiences and shared wants and needs, dignity um, to be heard, to be recognized, to be uh, empowered. Um, those, are, those are not uh, unique to any one culture or community. What do you think is our collective responsibility here now in, as listeners to these stories? So I think, you know, um, if someone trusts you enough by telling you their story, it is a contract. I see so much bravery in all the people who've written to us. Um, and the thing I noticed was, although they were subject to grave injustice, um, they want to serve humanity, right? Um, and um, uh, if we talk about better stories, I guess they are living beings, living uh, epitomes of the better story, being subject to the worst of humanity, but showcasing your best. So that is, the storyteller is your better story. For us, the, 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 it's a call to action. It's a further call to action to continue to organize both at our local level, but then also to reach across to each other, to others, uh, to amplify our voices. It's a call to action to, to be available to young leaders, to not so young leaders, to emerging leaders, anybody who wants a platform and wants to, 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 to be amplified in their voice. Um, I think it's a call to action also to tell our own stories. So, so for me, some of the messaging is tell your stories or somebody else will. Um, and the person who tells them may not tell them from a place of truth, from a place of dignity, from a place of honesty. Um, and, and, and also, um, if you don't see your stories reflected in your community and, and you tell them yourself or you find them, you seek them in other communities. Finally, is what I would say is, um, if nothing we have said resonates with you, then please just take time to read these stories. Um, read these stories because they lay the blueprint out um, of what you should be doing. Let these young people, um, um, you know, tell you how you can um, aspire to be, I think, half as brilliant as them. And, uh, you know, if that still doesn't move you, then. So faith and faithfulness. Hello. It's so nice Hello. to meet you and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We've been, I've been watching your video over and over again. So I feel like I know you also. And can mm -hmm. you tell me what your inspiration was to start the amazing school um, and program that you submitted the story about? During the pandemic, a lot of, um, as we all know, a lot of schools were shut down. So um, global events have, were canceled. So we, we went on the street and we saw some children, they were playing, they would sleep, wake up and nothing to do. So I was like, ah, these children, they are, they are not doing anything and other children are learning. Why are these children not learning? So we decided to do something about it. We felt like we need to make sure that these children are also learning just the way other children are learning online. And we believe that they are online classes, basically, mm -hmm. are for those who are privileged. But what about those children who does not have access yeah. to the internet? Does this mean they wouldn't learn? So we had to do something about it. We decided to solve this problem. And that's why we decided to come up with this idea of starting a prep class. We have uh, gather these children who yeah. does not have access to online education or internet, train them, teach them, make because we believe basically that education Jesus. is for all and no child deserves to be left behind, regardless of how poor you are or how rich you are. You're not supposed to be left behind. Yeah. And we have received testimonies from their parents on the educational improvement mm -hmm. of their children. And they are also excited because their children are now learning again, regardless of the circumstances on ground, even in the midst of a global pandemic. Yeah. Can you tell me what's next? What's next for you? Are you expand this program? What, what do you think is next? Next, basically we are planning, uh, we want to like open a, a school, school, a school, a school for these children. A school whereby we can be funded by the NGOs and whoever who can support us. So we're going to open a school where these children who does not have who does not have income like money or stuff like that, 
they could come and learn yes. for free. We want to do it for them. Even at a young age, we believe that we can, yes, we can impact knowledge. We can impact knowledge. And we believe that our voices matter and can yes, be heard. Yes, still be heard. Yes. You're, you're twin sisters. Yes. And have you always been partners in what you're doing or? Always. For always. a very long time, we became so passionate of driving equality education for the girl child. Basically for the girl child, because most of the time, yes. some families, they, they wouldn't allow like the female children to go to mm -hmm. school. They believe that our oh, education is meant for the male children. Mm -hmm. And we, we are against that because we believe that every child, both male and female, deserves have education. equal right to edu education. Yeah. So we fight for that. You know, we have this saying at Girl Rising, which is um, one girl with courage is a revolution. And boy, you yeah. put two of you together and it's unstoppable. So thank you so much. Everything we have to face it Without a sound we take a step Inside our hearts are racing If it takes forever We'll get there together Hey. Hey.